Okay. Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you are very welcome to the second seminar in our EU cross-border funds forum and think tank. I'm Karina Vaughan from Catalina Consulting, working in partnership with IFI Global on this series and on a broader series of events on the EU cross-border funds industry. Uh, some of you might have joined us back in May when uh, we had a great webinar on the opportunity for an all Ireland approach to the funds industry. And if you were one of 200 guests at our Dublin seminar in September last year that we delivered in partnership with PwC Ireland, uh, you'll be pleased to know that we're planning an online event in early 2021, also in partnership with PwC. So our London and Luxembourg events will follow and we'll keep you informed as hopefully we move from this uh, virtual environment to some kind of face-to-face -face engagement, perhaps in the second half of next year. I will hand you over now to Simon Osborne from IFI Global and I'll rejoin you for Q&A. Uh, thank you very much, Karina. And uh, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. As Karina says, this is the second in a series of uh, forum online events uh, we have been developing. When we started this, we assumed, uh, we did the first one at the end of, uh, in late October, we sort of believed Boris Johnson that, uh, that the deal, if there was gonna be a deal, would be done by the middle of October. Uh, and we obviously uh, got that wrong and I did say uh, to various people the good news is we're doing this on the 20th of November so we must have something decided by the time we do the second one of these that was we thought absolutely certain well here we are on November the 20th so therefore not much more uh, than a month to go until the transition agreement comes to an end and we are no wiser about whether or not there is going to be a, a deal between uh, the UK and the EU. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to try and make this as ve very much as interactive as possible. Um, we are going to um, ha have a reserve a short period at the end for formal period for questions and answers, which you can do either by emailing in questions using the Q&A tab, or we would very much like it if one or two of you or several of you decide to take advantage of the hands up facility that's on the bottom of your screens. We will bring you up onto, uh, onto the screen. So please ask your question live, should you wish to do that. We would love that if, if one or two of you were brave enough to come and join us up here on, on the panel as it were. But if not, please go ahead and any comments, not just questions, any comments, any thoughts you have, uh, just send them through uh, the Q&A button. And don't wait until um, uh, the formal end of our chit chat. After my very short intro comments I'm about to make, I'm, I'm going to go to James and to Sheena and uh, we will carry on our conversation. Do feel free to participate from that moment onwards. We would love your comments uh, from the early stages of this particular uh, discussion today. Okay. Um, when all this is decided, and when I say this, I mean Brexit, um, there will doubtless be a lot of technical assessments from law firms on what it all means for the fund management industry. Uh, today, what we are going to do is to try and give, um, give that some context, uh, which means that we are going to get a little bit more political than we normally do when we have our, uh, our, our events, um, because I really think... Um, you've got to understand the politics to understand uh, where we are today. Um, and I do feel very strongly that both sides uh, in the UK Brexit debate have really underestimated, um, perhaps one might even say ignored uh, the politics. Um, Leavers uh, thought that a deal would be relatively easy to get because uh, the EU sells the UK, I think it's a hundred billion pounds more than we sell them. Therefore, it was entirely logical that we could do a very simple, clear-cut free trade deal. It was said many times during the referendum campaign that that would be, quote unquote, the easiest deal in the world to do. And of course, we had uh, perfect regulatory alignment. So, so why not 
From an economic point of view, they were absolutely right, but they were ignoring the politics. Meanwhile, on the Remain side, they never understood or they've chosen to ignore uh, that the EU is first and foremost not necessarily an economic entity. Of course, it's got huge, enormous economic uh, consequences for us all, but it is first and foremost a political entity. It's all about you sign up for ever closer union. And the analogy I like to make for the UK is we joined this thing in the 1970s, um, a bit like joining a golf club with no intention of playing golf. We joined because we liked the bar, we liked going to uh, the clubhouse, and we liked going to the restaurant there. And we completely forgot that just outside the clubhouse, there was a golf course where people play golf. And we never wanted to participate in the, in, in the politics of the enterprise all the way along from the 1970s until our departure. We uh, dragged our feet. We've never wanted to be uh, part of this uh, ever a closer union. That whether or not other countries in the European Union want to be part of it is, is, a, is not something we're going to get into today, but the UK definitely uh, never wanted uh, to, to be part of it, hence uh, the situation we find ourselves in today. So what I'm going to quickly talk about before we get into the, uh, the panel discussion is the relevance of a uh, EU-UK deal for the fund industry, what no agreement on equivalence would mean, the ramifications of regulatory divergence for Ireland and Luxembourg, and what would happen or what might happen if the EU and the UK find themselves uh, as competitors rather than the situation they've been up until now in a sort of complementary fashion. Right, the relevance of, 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 a, of a UK, uh, EU-UK uh, deal. Um, it appears that the UK will need to agree uh, to some sort of regulatory alignment to get a deal over the line. Um, but what sort of deal that is and what sort of regulatory alignment that, that might be, here we are to repeat on the uh, 20th of November, I don't know, neither does anybody else. I think the chances of something like this happening, if there, if there is a deal, it's going to be a very skinny deal, but it's, it's really not going to um, uh, probably amount to an awful lot. And that's even if it happens. And there is, I would guess, so we can all have our guesses at this, uh, probably a 50-50 chance it will not happen at all. Because the reason is, is that the UK really feels it wants the freedom to do its own thing in the future, uh, whereas the EU um, does not want this competitor uh, on, on, its, on its doorsteps. Um, and uh, all the way along uh, since the referendum vote, the way the EU has treated this has basically been to treat us like very naughty boys and girls that need to have our bottoms spanked. And that's why I think we ended up uh, with uh, the situation with uh, uh, Martin Selma, who was the person responsible for picking Barnier to be the chief Brexit negotiator. Barnier's previous track record with the UK had been an unmitigated disaster. He was the person responsible for the early drafts of AIFMD, which really angered a lot of people in London, in the city and in the alternative asset management industry. And I would argue was one of the contributing factors to the reason we ended up with a referendum and uh, the no vote. Certainly a lot of alternative managers on the back of the early drafts. The, the drafts got a little bit less ba bad after Barnier left and the early drafts were really awful. Um, and uh, that was Barnier in his department's doing back at the time. So it was a bit of a surprise to some that Martin Selma, um, who was um, running Jung John Cor Juncker's um, office and really everyone thought the person who was more in charge than Jean-Claude Juncker at the time picked Barnier which really was uh, considered by many to wind up the British. He doesn't even speak great English. If we'd had uh, a free trading Dutchman or Dane or wherever it might have been we wouldn't be sitting here this morning having this discussion. The deal would have been done a lot more for a long time ago. Um, so um, Equivalence. This is an example of um, how far things have deteriorated between the EU and the UK. Uh, and it's somewhat alarming, to put it mildly. Um, the first sign 
at least I got, and I think many of us got, that things were not going to go well on equivalents uh, was uh, at the mid part of this year when both the EU and the UK failed to reach a, a target date they set themselves for completing assessments of each other's regulatory uh, regimes. By the way, back then, you know, we always thought equivalence was the least we were going to get off the EU. Um, when Theresa May was Prime Minister, people thought, oh, we can't just deal, live on equivalence. That's not going to be good enough. And she was trying to get a much closer deal on financial services and equivalence. And all the arguments were, oh, no, we can't end up with this because equivalence is, you know, can be withdrawn at short notice. It's not that great, blah, blah, blah. We've got to do better than equivalence. Well, we're now likely not even to get equivalence. That's what I say about how far things have deteriorated. Um, the person responsible for financial services in the EU, whose last name I'm afraid is unpronounceable to me, Sheena pronounced it perfectly yesterday. Can you, Sheena, would you, can you help Vladis Drombrovskis? How do you pronounce that? Drombrovskis. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> has said that the EU was, quote, too busy, lots of other stuff on its plate, and would not be in a position to assess whether the UK was equivalent uh, before the end of uh, the uh, transition period. And then uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, Chancellor of the Exchequer, as you obviously all know, uh, uh, here in the UK, just the other day, I think it was Monday, the week before last, told Parliament that he has given up on getting equivalence, uh, uh, an equivalence agreement with the EU. And he's announced, uh, has been announcing in the last few days, uh, unilaterally what uh, EU firms can do to get equivalents from the UK government. And that's not been in agreement with Brussels, that's just him going off and doing it by himself. In response to that, a spokesman uh, for the EU said the reason they had not um, gone any further than they have is because Sunak uh, and the UK government will not provide clarity on whether the UK will diverge from EU rules and regulations. And that's really, as I said earlier, that's what it's all about. So regulatory di divergence, uh, even if we do, which is somewhat now unlikely, end up with uh, a, a deal on equivalence, um, there's still gonna be regulatory divergence next year, that's certain. Um, and it will go on doubtless for many years. Just an examples of where this is going to hit immediately. Sunak has already said, this is before the last few weeks, by the way, that there will be reforms to solvency too. I can't believe he even knows what PRIPS is, but he mentioned specifically PRIPS, the reforms to that. Uh, and um, there has been talk also of um, uh, a light to touch AI FMD regime for at least dedicate the dedicated uh, alternative managers in London. Obviously there's uh, the bigger shops, the Black Rocks as well than the others, M&Gs and who've set up uh, uh, in, the, in the sort of, the alternative and mainstream space, it wouldn't apply to them, but the smaller managers above the, 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 the 100 million threshold, the UK is likely to bring in a, a lighter touch uh, regulatory regime for dedicated alternative managers. That's something Andrew Bailey first brought up and mentioned a number of times when he was still at the FCA before he went to the Bank of England. Other reforms we put here are likely, I think they're certain actually, um, that's just the beginning, that's just your starter for 10. Meanwhile, on the EU side, um, the EU is going um, hell for leather for yet more uh, directives, regulations, all sorts of other things. Um, uh, and uh, in April next year, we get the EU cross-border distribution directive. By the way, I have no idea, I don't think anybody else does either, what sort of uh, agreement is going to be done uh, and be allowed for managers that maybe uh, have a manco in Dublin or Luxembourg and, but want to fly off from London to get involved in distribution and marketing in continental Europe. I don't know uh, where that will be. And as I say, I'm not sure anybody else does too. That may be covered in that directive next, uh, next spring. And then in the summer, we've got the EU investment firms regulation and a directive. And then we have this thing called the FS FSDR, which is the, the sustainable rule book. It was gonna come in in March, uh, lock, stock and barrel, but they put most of it back, not all of it, but most of it back uh, probably till the beginning of uh, uh, 2022. Uh, that's not a definite date, but that's the date people think it will be put back to. It was gonna be all coming in in March. 
And then of course, lurking around is AIFMD2. So that again, and that's just that uh, the EU start of the 10 and we'll doubtless be more stuff coming along as well. Um, finally, before we get into the panel, uh, just to give you a sense of where we could be going. I said to us before we started this call, we all think, or at least I thought, uh, from the date of the referendum until the end of the transition period, that would be it for Brexit. It will be done and dusted. I had this rather awful thought, actually, just in the last day or so. We could still be at the beginning of this. We could be at this for years to come, arguing about how this will all play out. And it could, I hope to God I am wrong, but it could get quite nasty. And I'll just give you some examples of possibly how that might happen to give you a sense of the ways things that might go wrong. It's quite likely, no one's uh, sure yet, that the EU is going to at least try and change the rules for portfo portfolio management delegation for um, uh, at least European funds. I think funds investing in the US, that's fine. They'll keep, you know, there's no way they're going to tamper with that. The Americans will get very angry indeed if they did, and there'll be, they know there'll be retaliation. Ditto funds investing in Japan, no problem with that. Funds investing in emerging markets, et cetera, no problem with that. But the argument is funds investing in Europe and the UK runs London principally, but Edinburgh as well, something in the region of 2 trillion, a little bit more than 2 trillion euros worth of um, assets are invested in Europe on behalf of European savers and investors. And the e EU is not gonna be comfortable having um, uh, this uh, rather naughty Anglo-Saxon country uh, off its northwest coast, uh, making all the portfolio management decisions for the widows and orphans of Europe without them having any control on that. So it's very likely that there will be some changes to that, nothing's for sure yet. If that does happen, that would be quite provocative and it could be considered, considered discriminatory if they're gonna do it just for European funds, but they're not gonna do it for American or Japanese or emerging market funds. So the UK could consider retaliation. One of the ways it could retaliate would be um, to set up as uh, an alternative fund center in one of the free ports that the Boris Johnson government is looking at uh, implementing uh, very soon after we do our full-scale Brexit beginning of next year. And conceivably, for example, you could have an alternative fund center for managers who distribute funds in Switzerland, which is after all by far the second biggest market in Europe and obviously outside the EU, as well as for the rest of the world. Uh, and therefore managers who don't really have any particular interest in distributing their funds in uh, continental Europe, ex-Switzerland could be part of that. Um, provocatively, conceivably, it could even be in Northern Ireland. And if that happened for the first time, we could have a lower tax rate in the north than in the south, particularly as we put on the bottom item on this slide here, if a corporation tax in, in the European Union is to be uh, coordinated, which I think is quite likely to happen in the next few years. I put BEPS out there, we won't get into that in any detail now, but it would make sense for um, uh, managers to put their front and back office and all their operations as much as possible into one jurisdiction that will avoid problems with bets. And I will just say in passing before going to the panel that um, the treasury has done some work on this. It was some time ago, it's when George Osborne was the chancellor. So it wouldn't be, a, it's not starting from scratch. There is some work that has been done. So I've talked for long enough. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen, introduce our panel, um, and I'm going to make Karina uh, the uh, host so she can bring anyone in who wants to put their hand up and join this discussion. So I'm going to quickly introduce Sheena and James. Sheena Gordon Hart um, has had many very senior positions in the fund industry in London and has been part of various fund industry bodies that have negotiated with Brussels. She is now an independent fund director based in Luxembourg. So she is our Luxembourg representative here today. James McKnight is a lawyer with Simmons & Simmons in Dublin, advising asset managers on setting up in Ireland and in other jurisdictions around the world. Um, can, Sheena, can I come to you first? Any reactions to that? And, and in particular, uh, 
given the situation we're in, what do you think this might mean for Luxembourg? Well, um, I think on the whole, um, jurisdictions like Luxembourg, like Ireland, are, are, are pretty well prepared. I mean, in the sense that they've understood the implications uh, from day one because of the close relationship uh, that exists between uh, the UK and Luxembourg and indeed Ireland. So I think that sort of um, uh, closeness has helped them be on the front foot. What we've seen obviously in the last couple of years is quite a lot of activity with um, a number of managers, uh, one in particular I can think of that had a master feeder arrangement uh, with the master in the UK and the feeder in Luxembourg, basically restructuring to create a, an independent corporate structure um, in um, Luxembourg, complementary to, to the UK one, um, and um, basically making that its, um, its cross-border um, product. So um, I actually don't think that from the Luxembourg perspective, there's going to be, uh, you know, there's no cliff on the 1st of January. I think people are pretty well prepared, pretty well informed. I think the problems will be in other areas, in the real trade areas, um, where if there isn't an agreement and WTO and all that kind of thing, uh, potentially there will be problems. But I think actually, you know, asset managers are pretty good at being on the front foot, very good at adapting. Um, and so I don't see it as um, a particular issue. I think what you referred to earlier about politics is important, though, because the notion that, you know, that funds, but more importantly, the underlying investors should become political footballs in an argument between politicians really annoys me. Um, one of the most important things is that, you know, we should be, as an industry, uh, providing products, vehicles, investment products uh, for investors. They should be our first uh, concern. But it does seem to me that very often um, Brussels sees things through a political prism and not necessarily uh, through what I would regard as the investor prism. Um, you know, seeing life through the investor lens is really important, putting them at the front of uh, your concerns. Um, I mean, you know, just just um, slightly tongue in cheek, but how many investors do you know that actually read the kid or the soon to be prips? How many? You know, when we go to our to our platform, we have to tick that we've read and we've understood absolutely everything. Most people don't. Um, so uh, what I would like to see is um, an approach from uh, the Brussels policymakers that really does put investor interests at the forefront and that this equivalence question, I mean, you know, it beggars belief that they can't make a decision about whether the UK is equivalent on the 31st of December. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, the rules haven't changed at that point. So equivalence is a given. Um, and, um, you know, that, that annoys me because the politics is going to override um, investor interests. Um, as far as Luxembourg is concerned, I think pretty much business as usual from my perspective. I think people are well organized. They know what they've got to do. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got a, a, a regulator and a jurisdiction that is very supportive of uh, industry growth. And that's important. Thank you. And uh, James, can I come to you for uh where you believe, I would say Ireland, even more than Luxembourg, of course, Luxembourg to a very large extent as well, but even more proportionately, Brexit has had such an enormous uh, impact upon Dublin and Ireland, and not just in the fund industry, but also, of course, in the wider economy and the issues with the border and all that good stuff. So yeah. what, what do you think, given where we are today, is going to, what are the, what are the issues that the Irish fund industry are going to have to address? going forward into January next year. Yeah, and I mean, just to kind of talk a little bit, you touched on it a bit, the kind of overall impact, and Sheena mentioned it as well, around trade. I think, you know, you know, Ireland certainly has more ties, I think, to the UK that go, you know, way beyond financial services. And as a kind of an impact as a whole, 
um, on Ireland as a country, it, it, it's it's probably a net negative because you know you have this kind of all all, all island economy. Um, Britain being our biggest trading partner, so so the, it really has big potential. You know, Ireland has a lot of interest in how how the the Brexit negotiations have gone so far, and it is worrying uh, for Ireland as a country um, as to how badly they've gone so far. Um, you know, so you know overall, it's probably a net net negative in the financial services industry. Um, I suppose it has been a positive in that it's 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 changed the profile of of Dublin and Ireland as a as a financial services centre. I mean, you know, not even five years ago, or well, maybe a little bit more, Ireland was known as a as a you know, essentially an offshore uh, fund fund domicile or a servicing centre where we're servicing lots of payment funds through our admin and, and uh, admin houses, uh, and that's really changed um, uh, and quite noticeably in the last um, number of years. So, a lot, you know, lots of uh, I suppose Brexit firms are start, uh, you know, setting up in Ireland, and you know, initially that that kind of everybody was. Um, it was a good thing for the financial services industry in Ireland because it you know, drove lots of levels of business. It, it really embedded the industry in Ireland, I think, which was the, you know, the big concern for a long time is that, and I think we'll touch on this later, is that you know, if the UK wanted to just, uh, at, at a stroke of a pen, make itself a fund domicile, then all those Irish funds from UK managers move back. Whereas now there's actually people on the ground. They have actual operations on the ground. So it's, it's, it's kind of, lessened that risk that you know, Ireland is a fund domicile that that could be taken away at, at any minute um it's you know it's, it's driven into kind of other areas that are kind of now I suppose try, uh, starting to raise a little bit of concern in, in terms of uh, the financial services industry so initially it was it was great um lots of people coming over setting up substance there but now we start getting into um you know how much substance, too much substance potentially being needed in in Dublin, the impact that that might have on the like the, the view of Ireland as a as a a, a fund manager friendly friendly domicile, um, and you know we'll, t well again I think touch on this later um, the the potential changes to the ability to delegate portfolio management to third countries um, is really, really worrying from a, from an Irish uh, financial services standpoint. So it's, you know, it started out good for financial services it, as things have moved along. It just seems like there's, um, I suppose at the start, we assumed that there would, wouldn't be that much divergence so quickly. It looks like there now will be for the, the points that you've mentioned and, and more. Um, so the, the kind of the counterweight to the, Bad stuff that was going to happen on the trade side was financial services, but now there's there's a few kind of threats looming on the horizon for for, for that as well. Unfortunately, you've just given me a, a, another reason which I never really thought of before until you just said it, James, about why there's been this uh, uh, building up of substance in uh, in uh, Ireland and and indeed Luxembourg, which is that uh, it's a very good point you never thought of. Before. It's just that it once you know fund management company XYZ has gone and done it, put their office in, hired their staff, done all that. Uh, as you say, if Rishi Sunak or Boris Johnson decides to set up Liverpool, I always use, I don't know why I do, but I always use Liverpool as my example of a free port in the UK where, you know, a financial, service cent financial services centre could go. Um, it would be difficult for them to move because they've done, they've been, and done all the hard work in Dublin or in the suburbs of Dublin, and they're not going to just get up and shoot off somewhere else. Uh, they've already done that, so, which is a very good point. But nonetheless, uh, I'd like to ask you both this. Um, do you think, if you're being completely honest, um, a lot of the substance that has been developed both in Dublin and Luxembourg has been what I would call potentially artificial substance? Is it really needed? Is it really necessary? Is it really done to prevent partly at least done to prevent uh, the, those jurisdictions becoming sort of Brexit flags of convenience for UK managers. I mean, the CBI was very quick, straight out our, after the referendum to say it was not going to allow British managers to come over and just set up a one man and dog operation and basically carry on doing everything from London via the, what, that one man and dog, dog operation in, uh, in Dublin. Um, but as you as you hinted in your comments back, uh, just then, James, have they gone too far in the CP86 review, which we discussed on our prep call yesterday, 
uh, the language was really very severe, saying the minimum of three full-time employees at the most basic, simple uh, structures and going substantially up. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier on this week that is a uh, standalone manco. They had to go and negotiate uh, with the CBI um, and the CBI want them to have 12 full-time, well-paid uh, jobs in full-time, well-paid jobs in Dublin. They negotiated it down to nine. Apparently, you can negotiate with the CBI on that. But this is, as you said yourself, it's radically changed Dublin, uh, mm. the fund industry, and it's great for employment in the greater Dublin area, if not across the whole island of Ireland. But is some of this substance artificial, and is it going to potentially price Ireland out of the market, or indeed Luxembourg out of the market, especially if the UK sets up in competition. Can you both respond to that? Well, I think, I think what you've just described is absurd. Um, you know, a, a, alongside the long list of regulatory initiatives that uh, the Commission has on its, um, on its uh, agenda is digitalization. Excuse me, this, this whole substance thing runs counter to the, to, you know, the effectiveness of digitalization, is it just a word? Does it have no meaning? Because if it does, then that is that has to be part of the solution. Also, you know, just to um, repeat what I said earlier, you know, is this, uh, I, I think the, the, the regulations that force this kind of thing are artificial. They're not creating artificial substance, but you know, the arguments for it run counter to investor interests. You know, we, we've come a long way with technology. People talk about fintech um, and how important it is. Um, we've come a long way, um, but are you saying that actually everybody has to replicate everything everywhere in Europe? That, that can't be right. Um, you know, and I, I remember when, you know, we were looking at AIFMD and whether risk management could be outsourced and so forth and so on. You know, one of the things that struck me was how many risk managers are there in the world? You know, um, you, exactly. yeah. you know, to replicate all the time is inefficient and it doesn't serve investor interests. And I, I really wish regulators would, you know, sit down or, or certainly policymakers, first of all, sit down and say, what are we trying to achieve and what do we want the world to look like for the investors for whom we are going to be setting out laws, regulations, directives. Um, and, I, and I'm afraid that none of them seem capable of doing that. And that's partly, I suppose, because so many of them are not investors themselves. Um, I was looking at the, um, the Q&A that was given to Christine Lagarde when she became uh, head of the um, European Central Bank. And one of the questions was about, you know, do you have any interest, shareholdings, that kind of thing. She actually managed not to answer the question, um, but I suspect it's because she didn't have any. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, I, I think we ought to have informed policymakers, not just, you know, politically driven uh, policymakers. And I know that's very controversial, and I'm not trying to be critical of regulators in any deliberate sense. Um, after all, they are delivered regulations from policymakers. They're the ones that I, that I would be criticizing because I don't think they think about investor interests and delivering value for money. Um, and I'm not trying to take an, a UK view on that, but you know, ultimately, if you're gonna say that you have to have 12 people in jurisdiction duplicating probably, um, uh, work that's already being done elsewhere, then that's a nonsense. Well, it's not, it a, it's, it may, it's not, in addition to being a nonsense, it's a very expensive nonsense because these yeah. are quite, these are seriously well paid jobs yeah. uh, and full time jobs. Um, uh, by the way, I'm delighted somebody's already uh, put a, a comment saying they completely agree with Sheena on uh, uh, what they've said here. Um, oh. With AIFMD AI has provided no value to investors. Um, uh, and please, others, do use the Q&A button or please do, as I said earlier, please do use the hands up, put your hand 
uh, click on the hands up facility and we'll bring you into the discussion. We'd love to do that. James, can I get your reactions uh, to, to that? Do you think there is a risk that Ireland could be pricing itself out of them of the market? The moment that they could do, uh, they meaning Dublin and Luxembourg, and do what it likes because there hasn't been any competition really. Yep. Um, so, you know, if you want to play in the EU market, that's what you've got to do. But the Admittedly, if you go and set up in the in the UK, they're not going to let us, you know, set up a much cheaper alternative in, or as I keep saying, Liverpool. But for the rest of the world, and there's an awful lot of funds, and James will know this much better than me, um, that are sold around the world from Dublin, from their Dublin base. Now, that would be the worry. Um, I don't know what proportion of the funds in Dublin are sold in, say, the Asia-Pacific region or Latin America or Australia or even... Uh, North America, but it must be a decent proportion of them. And that would be something that would worry me if I was in the Irish fund industry. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's definitely a worry. And the, I suppose that the initial Brexit firms that, that moved over, you know, they, in terms of the substance that's being requested now, you know, they will have already been through the ringer when they were setting up their firms. I think you know, what the CP86 um, or fund management company guidance, a lot of that is getting at is because, you know, before Brexit and this kind of real focus on the possibility of regulatory arbitrage and, and letterbox entities. Uh, it, it was it was possible to set up in Ireland with very few people and you know you know two Irish resident directors even in some cases for a management company and then delegating everything back. So that, that's been possible for years. Um, the uh, around Brexit there was there was you know this push and it wasn't just in Ireland, I think it's you know throughout the EU in terms of new entrants coming in uh, or spinning out of the UK into into the EU, uh, and during the course of that, uh, those authorization processes, you know, coming up with numbers like the ten and twelves that 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 you've mentioned, but that in Ireland created this kind of two tier system then, because the the new entrants that came in as a result of Brexit, Brexit were required to have all the substance because you know they hadn't already set up in Ireland, and then the ones that had set up, uh, you know, a decade ago. They were operating with kind of two, you know, one, two, three people maybe. So I think a lot of what the update to the fund management company guidance was getting at was trying to capture those old firms that were already there that were operating with very, very little substance because the the new entrants as a result of Brexit would have already, you know, got, had to have that argument with the central bank around substance. I mean, you know, the the kind of I think immediate impact of of the CP eighty six review is that. I mean, self-managed funds in Ireland are essentially now gone. I mean, by this time next year, I, there, there won't be any. I mean, we haven't been setting them up for quite some time. We wouldn't, um, we haven't been um, even putting it out there as a as an option for 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 quite some time. But all of the legacy uh, self-managed funds, I think, will be gone in a year because it just, I mean, it doesn't make sense for a self-managed fund to have three full-time employees. It's you know, it's a bit of a bit of a nonsense. I think to even suggest that any of them would do that so it's it, it is a bit of a risk a, a risk for ireland and the eu generally in terms of um you know what they're asking people to do currently and there's no doubt that you know every client that we speak to it makes that same point about you know having substance in Ireland, but them not having anything to do but the, the the idea i think from the eu's perspective i mean it must be to uh, make people have substance in the eu uh, by implementing these rules and then over time, hope that kind of more senior, you know, as senior roles come up elsewhere, they will be put into the European entity rather than into the UK entity. So it's kind of, I, you know, the, the, that drive for substance is a, is, is, is definitely a, a, a long-term thing, I think. Um, and um, it's, um, you know, it's at the moment, it may seem like there, there won't be enough for people in, in, in Dublin or wherever to do, but over time, the plan that there will be, I mean, it, it, it was an interesting um, kind of uh, project that we had recently where we were discussing with managers who hadn't made any Brexit planning at all quite quite late in the day. Uh, and they were kind of doing a survey around different jurisdictions all over Europe, including Luxembourg, France, Italy, Germany. And you know, so we, we were able to kind of help them out with all of our offices there. But the, the message that came back around substance was the same from everywhere. They... The, the client was looking to find out where they needed the least substance possible and the message back from um, all of the kind of, I suppose, the not the Luxembourgers and the Ireland's, but they were also seeing pressure from their regulator uh, in terms of substance and they couldn't put a, a, a firm number on how, how much substance was needed. So Ireland have come out with this figure of three, but really I think that's probably 
if you go to any um, you know legitimate EU jurisdiction, uh, you're going to get back those kind of numbers back if if not more. So in terms of like Ireland pricing itself out, everyone's you know all other major European jurisdictions you'll 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 have the same issue. There may be some you know smaller island jurisdictions that uh, you know they're kind of up and coming or they see themselves as up and coming fund domiciles where you may you may get something by the regulator now. But you know the risk of that is you set something up somewhere like that, and then in a couple of years' time, um, when the when ESMA start to look at the at you know if there's any kind of mismatches, then you'll have the same rules applied there anyway, and then you end up with an entity somewhere kind of quite random. Right. But, um, what, but we... what about um, what about intra Europe, intra EU, James? I mean, if your French manager wants to come and set up in Ireland, I mean. I, just forget the UK for the moment, that if your French manager wants to come and set up in Ireland, why should he duplicate everything if there is a so-called single market? Or doesn't single market apply to investment funds? I mean, I, I actually think this is a serious question. And secondly, you know, everybody wants investment in fintech to make, um, you know, finance, financial services more efficient. But this runs counter to that. In an I EU mean, context, yeah, I mean, on the on the European manager side, I mean, I suppose it is possible for them to passport their services or or or, or set up a branch, and the, that fund management company guidance won't apply to them. And and that is actually something we have seen a little bit of, where um, you have, um, you know, we've had clients that have managers elsewhere in mainland Europe. They've seen this this note from the central bank saying you need three full time employees in Ireland, and then you know, obviously getting very worried and thinking they need to set up substance there, but it, it's still possible for them to passport in and manage manage Irish funds from 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 France. You know, the the the, the local regulators like the central bank, I think, probably would prefer for all Irish funds to be, have an Irish manager appointed because it's kind of a, a closer regulatory hook, but th there's not much that they can do to 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 your point around the thing, the internal market. You know, if a, if a manager wants to set up an, an AFUM in you know, France or Cyprus or wherever and passport it in and manage an Irish fund, that's that's perfectly okay without any substance in Ireland. Can I just jump in and say that maybe this is the time we can get into the sort of more formal q and I don't know whether Karina, you want to come back in and uh, and uh, put any questions you've got there um, to, to, to the panel. Uh, also, I'm going to say it again, apologies for repetition. Please do, uh, audience, put either put your hand up, come in that way. This is the time. Uh, we sort of formally set aside for that or use as uh, the Q&A button, whichever you prefer. Is, do you have any questions there, Karina? Uh, yes, in indeed. Thank you, Simon. So, um, first of all, uh, I'd like to take everyone back, if I may, to uh, the period around 2008-2009 and a, a, a press release on uh, relating to minimum activities that was jointly made by the Republic of Ireland's Finance Minister, Brian Cowan, and the Finance Minister uh, for Northern Ireland, the Right Honourable uh, Peter Robinson, um, relating to a closer collaboration between the North of Ireland and the South of Ireland within the financial services sector. And uh, of course, at the time we had uh, just got over uh, or we're trying to get over the crash and uh, very little seemed to follow in terms of uh, developing this opportunity. Um, and so the, the question is, uh, if this uh, particular agreement were to be reinvented in some way, um, uh, in the light of Brexit, would it provide an opportunity to bring Ireland and the UK uh, together in some kind of uh, funds industry collaboration, or would it simply be seen as a way for the UK to have a backdoor into the EU? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a it's a it's a really interesting concept, and I think you know that the EU, to their 
well, to their credit, uh, have shown at least that they will have some flexibility around having Northern Ireland as that kind of, um, uh, you know, both the EU and uh, and the UK have a, have a foot in there. And it's kind of that, that halfway is in between the two. Uh, and, you know, there's a number of all island economies already existing on the island, island of Ireland. And, you know, that's partially the reason for the resistance around any kind of customs checks or, or borders, because as an island, it kind of, it operates as, as one single entity. I mean, the, the, um, it, it, you know, it is it, it is something I think that should be looked at. I'm I'm just not sure how, at, in the current climate how likely um, that is, uh, or at least if there for there to be a an agreement soon on something like that. But it, it should be something that's kind of kept kept in the background, or something that's at least brought to the discussion table as to how the financial in- services industries between. Ireland, um, the EU, and the UK should link up somehow. I think Northern Ireland could could provide a a, a solution there, but it's just that you know it hasn't been on the agenda yet. Uh, everything about Northern Ireland has been about trade and the border, um, but it, it's it's certainly an interesting concept and, and one that should be discussed in time. But I fear that it, it won't be discussed until all of the other issues are 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 are, are sorted out. Um, can I just uh, perhaps add to that um, the subject, subject I just touched upon in my introduction on the, the question of corporation tax um, and ask James uh, whether there is a feeling in Ireland right now um, that uh, there, the Irish government is going to have to concede and um, uh, agree to what I believe both France and Germany both are very keen to have. And when they when they get together and want something, they tend to get it, which is coordination on corporation tax. And there's long been lots of negative comments about your corporation tax rate from the French and the Germans, especially the French. Is there a fear that you're going to ha- see some significant increases in corporation tax, particularly with the pandemic, when everyone's going to need more um, um, uh, spending or sort of, sort of revenue to, to pay for the spending that they're going through? And just to put the cat amongst the pigeons, uh, what would happen if uh, if there was a free port in Northern Ireland at the same time as corporation tax was going up in the Republic? Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, there's definitely a, a, I don't know if it's fear, but concern uh, in Ireland around uh, corporation tax. I mean, even to such an extent that, you know, every budget that we have, the Minister of Finance, when he makes the announcements, he he will confirm that the 12 and a half percent rate will continue. And you're, you know, you're kind of like, well, why do you, why do you need to confirm that every year is not just a given, but clearly, clearly it's not on something that needs to be confirmed on an annual basis. So there, and, and you, you'll see the kind of various points of attack um, uh, from the EU generally, or the commission in particular on, on Ireland's tax rate. And now they're starting to use, you know, the competition commissioner, uh, you know, the Apple case as well as one that everyone, everyone saw, and they're trying to, find different angles to get a tax because tax has obviously been been left out of all the all the EU treaties to date but you know it's definitely a target uh, for sure I mean the thing I, I suppose Ireland uh, what they've um, you know what they've they've kind of had to walk a bit of a tightrope in terms of in particular around the, the tech companies which I suppose is a little bit off off topic but you know there's many of them in Ireland and you know they were there at least initially for that for that uh, for the tax rate and the kind of uh, BEPS planning that you could do. Um, what Ireland has kind of said no to officially is the digital services tax. But I think that's something that probably looks like, you know, what they've said is, you know, they all agree on a kind of a, a an OECD or a European level, but they won't impose a digital services tax themselves or they won't increase their tax rate themselves. So I think if there's a kind of a, uh, the, the, the days of being able to, make very aggressive tax planning in Ireland possibly are, are done. Um, but in terms of the headline tax rate, I think Ireland would be very resistant to changing that. I think it would take a lot um, to force Ireland to change it. I mean, it would nearly mean rewriting the the, the, the rules of the EU. But, you know, where, where the EU might get around is something like a, a pan-European digital services tax. And that will impact Ireland quite a lot because there's so many, so many tech companies here. Um, I mean, funds themselves obviously are, are, are not subject to the to the to the tax rate. Um, managers that set up here would be, I guess, but um, it, 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 there's definitely a concern around Ireland's tax rate. But I think it would be a big shift in the EU um, to to move to directly uh, require 
um, uh, Ireland to increase its its tax rate. Um, I mean, again, on the on the kind of on the Northern Ireland point, I think I think if there's a free port established in Northern Ireland, then it, that is something Ireland might be forced to take action on um, in terms of uh, a, a border or customs checks on the border, or indeed customs checks um, in in Dublin, um, because you know the if if you have a free port in the north and then an, an open border which everyone on the island of Ireland wants to keep then there doesn't really seem that many yeah. other uh, other options other than um you know the the ports in the republic of ireland in their exports to europe and then imposing uh, tariffs but that's and i think um you know the uk know that that is uh, a real possibility that okay we're not going to put a border in northern ireland ourselves we'll let things flow uh, back and forth and that puts the onus on ireland to um to put border checks on their own borders with the EU, which is obviously something Ireland and the EU don't want. So uh, that would that would really uh, uh, set the cat amongst the pigeons if there was a free port there um, and tax rate dropped to whatever. Um, but I think it would um, it would uh, resort uh, or result in some retaliation from from the EU. But and you know the south of Ireland actually would be the the kind of cannon fodder in that kind of situation. Okay, a couple more questions um, in then. Uh, so one uh, relating to ESG uh, that um, is, I suppose, has two parts to it. So uh, the first, obviously, we're expecting a raft of uh, new regulations um, from the EU uh, relating to ESG. And so the question is, uh, what does the panel think is going to happen in relation to those regulations and uh, what uh, does the UK need to do to, to, to mitigate against that? And then the second part of the question is uh, post-Brexit, um, what is the opportunity for the UK uh, in green finance? Do you want to take that, Sheena? Well, I think, um, you know, the ESG question is really interesting. And I think most managers have got it fairly high up their agenda because obviously March um, 2021 is when the, when the, when these start to come into um, force. Most managers that I'm seeing at the moment are discussing how they're going to comply. Uh, and the problem is that without level two rules, it's very difficult um, to, to make plans. A couple of managers I know haven't made any plans at all, and that's a bit of a worry. Um, but, um, you know, ESG, most of the regulators are saying they want to make sure that people aren't greenwashing, and that's that's been a bit of a problem because ESG has been the, you know, it's it's been the kind of hip thing to be, um, and everybody says they are, but actually probably they're not. Um, I, I am a bit concerned about, again, um, rushing headlong in with regulation. I think, uh, you know, a market-led solution would have been better. However, a lot of work's been done. Um, we, you know, have a, a partial taxonomy now. Um, there are obviously political headwinds and we've got, you know, the Paris Agreement and all that kind of thing to take into consideration. Some very tight timelines there too. Um, I think the UK probably has a, you know, has a reasonably good record in terms of stewardship and stewardship is part of um, part of the G if you like of ESG um, and so I, I think you know managers are pretty used to engaging uh, with companies they invest in they don't all um, participate necessarily as much as they should but I think you know I think the UK has a chance to perhaps diverge um, and and be more um, flexible, if you like, because I, I actually think if you start, uh, you know, if you start regulating too tightly, you know, uh, there'll be things that come along that aren't included that suddenly become issues. So I, I would prefer a more flexible approach, let's put it that way. But then I usually argue for a more flexible approach, approach so that shouldn't, that shouldn't surprise anybody. But I, I do worry about too prescriptive uh, a set of regulations. Uh, I don't think it's in investors' best interest. And I think also it can then be hijacked for political ends, which I am totally opposed to. Well, the, the other thing is, this comes back to sort of a previous point we discussed 
earlier about regulatory divergence is that I only heard the other day, I mean, the last week or two, is that it's, I think, now certain or very likely that the UK is going to diverge from the SFDR, the sustainable rule book that Karina uh, was just mentioning in her question. Uh, again, is that going to make it, who knows, is that going to make it difficult for funds that don't reach, if it is the same standard, don't reach the same standard, UK funds, that is, from being distributed in the European Union. What is that? Where, where is that going to leave us? We have this sort of situation going on. It's just one of many examples of where this divergence well, could take it'll place. It'll depend upon what the, what the rules are for gaining access. So, for example, taking it the other way around, a Luxembourg or Irish fund going into the UK, will they? I mean, at the moment, we've got the, the TPR, the Temporary Permissions Regime, which is, you know, perfectly adequate from what I can see from what my clients are saying uh, for, for their purposes to get back into the UK. But what if the value for money rules come in? Uh, what, if, what if the UK regulator says, OK, to get authorization in the UK, you're going to have to also provide the same value for money assessment that UK funds do? Now, that will prove problematic, I think. Uh, for a number of managers. I mean, we know that in, in Luxembourg, I don't know whether this is the case in Ireland, but certainly after ESMA showed a keen interest in fund costs, I think on the back of what the UK had introduced, um, the Luxembourg regulator is clearly in 2021 going to be taking a very close look at you know the cost structures within um, Luxembourg investment funds. And that, and that, that will be interesting. That may you know, enable people to to um, to transfer uh, what they've learned from their UK fund ranges into their Luxembourg fund ranges to this to do the same sort of value for money um, as assessment uh, as the UK is doing. But uh, you know, the UK is still on, I think, on the, on the learning curve in how to do it. There's been quite a lot of debate about whether they're adequate or not. Um, but I would expect that. It all boils down to what the what the barriers are that are put in place to allow you to distribute or not either way. I think the UK is fairly, usually fairly open um, to uh, you know to to competition. So I don't see it as a particular issue. Although that value for money thing worries me a bit. I see. It's, I can hear the bells from the church in Tame, which is where I am, ringing for saying it's twelve o'clock. But there's one or two questions left we haven't that have come up. We haven't answered. I don't know whether can we? Should we do? In, can we ship very short? Is there anything else you've got, Karina? Because there's one question I can see here. The, what is there anything you, in the seconds we've got remaining? Um, it, it's so. I, I mean, I suspect this is probably going to take much longer than uh, than a few seconds. Uh, the opportunity for the UK post-Brexit in green finance. I think it is going to be. We should do that as a whole separate subject, I think. Yeah, I don't think you could do a, a soundbite on that. Another, unless unless James or Sheena have a soundbite that's available. And there's, a, I can see there's a question here from um, someone saying that the corporation, it seems the focus shouldn't just be on the rate of corporation tax because, of course, member states can define deductions like depreciation differently, which is a fair, we don't need probably to comment on that, but it's a very good point. Um, so is there anything else there you've got, or shall we shall we uh, uh, wind this up as we promised to finish at that's, 12? That, that's, that's all the questions we have at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Well, well, thank, well thank you all very much for joining us uh, this morning or this lunchtime today. I hope you have a very good weekend. Next things on our uh, agenda in terms of online events, we're having a Manco week. 1st, 2nd and 3rd of December, three events in very quick succession, exploring various different aspects of uh, Manco, standalone Mancos, Manco platforms, and some of the subjects we've been discussing this morning uh, will doubtless come up um, in, those, uh, in those events too. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Have a very good weekend wherever you may be, and you, uh, hopefully you, uh, see you the next time. Um, bye bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, James. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.